good good afternoon everyone or morning or evening depending on where you are right now i am gail lotret i'm a researcher at the gem macro modeling unit here at ifd and it's my pleasure to share this research conversation today on the challenges and opportunities for the developing country in green transition uh, perspective so to to achieve a sustainable future countries should adopt mitigation policy and and drive uh, drastic te technological changes and to be aligned with the paris agreement these changes have to occur at uh, high uh, space uh, at pace sorry and scale and obviously for developing economies this transformation are particularly challenging as uh, developing economies must deal not only with rapid uh, structural transformations to achieve uh, environmental goals but also with economic growth uh, inequalities reduction poverty education and so on so today's webinar will uh, will explore these uh, key challenges uh, and give insights on how developing countries may find a way to benefit from structural transformation and get a green transition that is both uh, socially fair and environmentally efficient so we will have uh, three presentations on this issue with uh, four different speakers and uh, all together, the presentation should last about one hour. So we can uh, save 30 minutes at the end to open the discussion with uh, the online participants. So everyone can ask questions in the question part here uh, in, in, the in the live storm. Uh, please do not put uh, the question into the chat, otherwise they might be lost into the flow of messages. So I will keep track on the question arise during the presentation and uh, ask them myself to the speakers at the end of all the presentation. Um, it would be maybe not possible to deal with to, to answer all the questions. So if you read a question that you like, uh, you can vote for him and uh, I will see that there is a main interest in a particular question. So the first presentation uh, is from Guilherme Magacho, who is a senior uh, economist at the Agence Française de Développement, IFD, here in Paris. Uh, he holds a PhD in land economy from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Uh, Guilherme works mainly with the ecological transition and economic development. He is also a research associate at the Cambridge Center for Economic and public policies and teaches uh, economic modeling at Université Sorbonne Paris Nord. And he's going to, to present today his work uh, on exposure to structural transition in an economic ecological uh, model. So, uh, Guilherme, uh, the, the floor is yours and you have about 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation, Guy. Uh, the model we are, or like the the presentation here is a little bit on the model that we're developing here at AFT. And the basis of the model was just published for uh, in World Development, which is a specialized review uh, journal for like this kind of issues. And was developed by me and other uh, AFD uh, researchers. The idea behind this model, behind this paper, behind this analysis is basically that we're talking, when we're talking about green transition, we're talking about something very specific that never happened before, of course, uh, but we have some parallels before. The idea that we had like structural change, transformations, technical economic transformations in the world is not new. The difference now uh, is that they are, these changes will be very rapid, very, very fast and some industries will emerge and some industries will decline and counters need to be prepared for that uh, why because they will be impacted differently depending on the structure of production trade and finance like if they depend a lot on these industries in terms of production trade and of course like finance is always behind the story uh, because a lot of policies will take place like uh, counters are already taking some different kinds of policies to force at some point uh, decarbonization but also technological chains are moving in this direction so the products will change have characteristics the world demand will change preferences will change people will start like uh, 
uh, demanding more of one product and less of the others, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but uh, in this analysis, what we're looking specifically is th three things that are especially interesting for developing countries. First is how these industries, especially these sunset industries, is in, are important for avoiding balance of payment constraints. Why? But basically because a lot of developing countries, most of the developing countries cannot produce the machinery's inputs for the transition and they need to import. If they need to import, they need to export to pay for these imports. So uh, we need to look at the impacts of the uh, these industries, the dependence of countries in terms of these industries, the sunset industries that will decline uh, for in terms of their exports and for raising raising a foreign currency for exchange. Also, we need to we need a lot of investments from governments, and then there is the need to think about fiscal imbalances. And we need to look at these industries in terms of the importance for countries uh, to avoid fiscal imbalances. And finally, and of course, if you're talking about developing countries, we need to generate employment, we need to increase wages, and then we need to look at what's the importance of these industries for generating employment and wages. Of course, the, there is like a lot of discussions about like green industries, these new industries, sunrise industries, will be more labor intensive and generate employment and wages, but this is not gonna be homogeneous across countries. Uh, there will be some countries that will lose and some countries that will win, and we need to look at this. Basically, the uh, instrument, the tool that we use to analyze these this impacts, uh, and then we have like the direct and indirect impacts, not only the direct ones, like the impacts on the value chain of the production, is the environmental input output matrices. What is interesting with these matrices? We have like not only the, for example, the CO2 emissions of the industry itself, but all the uh, embodied emissions that when you're producing, for example, aluminum, you're emitting when you're using energy, electricity, for example. And then this electricity that's embodied in aluminum production will be accounted the same for uh, all the other goods that we have. And using these matrices, we can look at the impact on the value chain as well. So if you lose unemployment, uh, we reduce the importance of one industry. And that's why we use this hypothetical extraction method. It's a method where we are like assuming hypothetically that one industry will not produce anymore. So you take off these industries from the, uh, uh, the uh, world economy. What's going to be the impact in all the other industries and all the other countries? Let's say that, for example, uh, France stopped producing a product, but this uh, when, when France decides to stop producing something, this is having uh, this has an indirect impact in all the countries that trade has trade uh, relations with France. And to do this, we use a, uh, this new database. It's one year from now that was launched, and the environmental multi-regional input output table with 164 regions and 120 different industries. Like we have very detailed level of industries, so it's uh, it's very interesting because we can look specifically. For example, here we have like uh, we calculate directly and directly this point. It's like uh, not exactly a point, but the, the blue one is showing the median of GAG emissions uh, by industry. So gas extraction, for example, is very emitting. Uh, Lignite and peat, cement is very emitting industry. And uh, these industries that are in the top, actually to all these industries that are here are very emitting because we're talking about 120 and here is only the most emitting ones. But of course, like gas, cement, uh, electric power generation, of course, electricity, they are the most emitting. And this is the distribution. You can see, for example, that raising of cattle is an industry that is a sector that is very emitting, of course, like uh, meat is very emitting, but there is a huge distribution. There are countries that are uh that produce with low emissions and countries that produce with very high emissions so we need to look at this and basically what you do is define what you call sunset industries industries that are tend to disappear in the next years or decades and here are these industries that we define as sunset industries we have like five large sectors with a lot of industries within them so fossil fuels for example have coal uh, lignite and peat, coke, 
petroleum, and we discuss, for example, gas extraction. Uh, of course, I, the timing is different for these industries to lose importance. Uh, we expect that coal is going to be like much faster than gas, but we are also expecting that all these industries will decline either because they will decline uh, in terms of demand or the technology will change and these industries will become less and less important as they produce now. And so the countries that depend in terms of trade, in terms of production, in terms of employment generation, fiscal revenues on these industries are the most impacted. We have electricity, but we take electricity only from fossil fuels, of course, because electricity is like a more generous thing. And for example, metals, we are taking only the metals that are very emitting, but we have metals that are emitting a lot and uh, has a, some relevant emissions, for example, nickel production. But because it's important for the transition, we take out from these sunset industries. We do not consider it as a sunset industry, of course, because it's a transition industry, an industry that's important for the transition itself. Well, here is the first simulation that we do. We calculate by, based on the hypothetical construction method. In the vertical axis, we have the net foreign currency revenues from the importance of the sectors for the foreign currency revenues. So for example, we have 100%, those countries that are in the top of the graph, which is like uh, DZA is Algeria. Uh, it's one of the most uh, exposed ones. Uh, we have Angola as well. We have Libya, Kuwait. These countries that are in the top, I don't know if you can see my... <laughs> these countries that are in the top are the ones that uh, are more exposed from the external perspective. In the horizontal axis, we have like taxes from sunset industries. We have those taxes that are the... Those countries that are more dependent on these industries from a fiscal perspective. And those that are in the extremely right, if you look, for example, we have uh, uh, Europe, uh, Brunei. These are countries that are extremely dependent directly and indirectly from the sunset industries that we're talking. Uh, and of course, these countries, like uh, the, if these industries decline, the, we can expect that they will have like a lot of fiscal imbalances, fiscal constraints, and then they have to find other ways to finance the government expenditure government investments to to guarantee that the transition will take place uh, here is a distribution of sectors as you can see fossil fuels this red part of the graph predominates it's basically the fossil fuels that are the most important industries to explain the both the external and the fiscal dependence but this is not homogeneous across countries you have some countries that for example the uh, indirect impacts, the impacts are on the value chain, are more relevant. Some countries are metals are more important. Some countries on non-metal minerals, which basically we're talking about like uh, uh, cement <laughs> is the most important one, is more, uh, more relevant, fertilizers in specific economies. Uh, looking at the socioeconomic level, we also look at uh, the importance of these industries to generate employment in the vertical axis of this graph and to pay wages in the horizontal axis. Well, uh, we have here a lot of countries that are extremely the right ones in the top, in the top right part of the graph. Uh, these are the countries where the good jobs are in sunset industries. And then why we need to care about this? Because like, if this industry is declining, the good jobs are being destroyed. Are the, these jobs being created in other industries? Uh, and here you have the color of the point, uh, which is social protection coverage. What is the social protection coverage? The share of the population that is covered by any social program. Basically, what we have is essentially that, of course, with some exceptions, but essentially what we have is that those countries that are more exposed to the social, to the green transition or the low carbon transition are the ones that are predominantly not very covered, the population is not very covered by social protection. So there will be like a lot of employment destructions. We are, they will lose a lot of employment. And because they are not covered by any social protection uh, system, there will be a lot of social issues that we need to care about. We need to think about when we're thinking about the transition. Uh, and here we see the, uh, what are the sectors, the industries that are the most important for explaining the socioeconomic exposure for the most exposed countries, of course. Uh, 
And here we see that fossil fuel is relevant again, but this is not anymore the most relevant industries. Indirect impacts are, in terms of employment, the most important uh, issue. So those countries that produce inputs, machineries for the uh, for these industries, for these sunset industries, but also metals, non-metallic minerals and fertilizers are very important. So, uh, in, uh, and when we're talking about metals and no metallic industries, we're basically talking about civil construction and household product, uh, house, uh, house construction. So these industries are extremely import, important. And in these industries, the way it's produced now, we have some kind of problem in terms of uh, the dependence of sunset industries, high emitting industries. Well, uh, we compare here some different countries and put here, I, I put here some examples like Colombia, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Mozambique, Nigeria, uh, uh, Algeria, Bolivia, Norway, and Nigeria. And we see that they have different types of exposure, different types of, uh, we say this is a multi-dimension exposure uh, because you're not looking at saying, and saying, okay, this is only social or it's only external. The NFX is, of course, like a uh, raise of foreign exchange. And this is important, for example, in the case of Algeria, which is like very exposed economy, Kazakhstan, Mozambique, but it's not as important, as, uh, so much important for Bolivia, for example. Or like uh, for Nigeria, it's very important, but employment and wages are not very important, which means that they have different types of exposure. In the case of Mozambique, for example, wages are very important. Most of the good jobs are in these industries. This is what the, the good jobs, I mean like the jobs where the wages are the highest. Well, we put for some cluster analysis to, uh, to group these countries according to different uh, types of exposure they have. So that's, we're talking about like a multi-dimension exposure. So you have like this group of purple, this purple group, the pink, the blue and the gray. And as you can see, the, uh, predominantly in the second bar, the second graph from the left to the right, uh, the pink and the uh, and the purple, they coincide, uh, kind of uh, coincide, uh, which means that the pink are more, they tend to be more external exposure. They depend on these industries for generating, fisc uh, raising uh, foreign exchange, while the other groups are like high, medium, and low exposure. And then we build this graph to condense this to have this everything together, like all the countries together. Uh, and of course, like we have countries like if you look at Latin America, we're talking about Brazil, Bolivia, and Colom Colombia and Ecuador as medium exposed countries, Venezuela as a very high exposed countries. When you look at Africa, the North Africa tend to be more exposed, and Middle East is very exposed as well. Uh, Central Asia. It's kind of, um, especially in terms of external exposure is very relevant. So we can classify based on these countries according to the different types of exposure they have to the low carbon transition to understand a little bit what these constraint, constraints can and may come from. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for watching the presentation. You can, yeah, here you can see you scan for the, the paper that was published. Uh, with like more details in terms of the methodology, the definition of sunset industries, and of course, uh, all the results that I try to show here very fast. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Guilherme, you are right on time. Uh, for those who join us uh, after the introduction, uh, I, I can remember that you can ask question in the question part uh, of the, the app. Uh, now we are moving to the second presentation that will be presented by presented by two speakers, by Gabriel uh, Porcil and, and Camila Gronkov. So Camila is an uh, economic uh, affairs officer of the United Nation Eco uh, United Nation Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, the, the CEPAL uh, office in Brazil. She holds a uh, PhD in economics of climate change from the University of East Anglia in United Kingdom, and a master degree in economics from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And Gabriel Porcil is also an uh, economic uh, affairs officer at CEPAL and chief of the CEPAL office in Montevideo. 
He was professor of economics at the Federal University of uh, Paraná in Brazil and visiting scholar in the University of Sao Paulo, Udelar, Columbia University and the New School for Social Research. And he holds a PhD from the London School of Economics in the United Kingdom and a master's degree from Unicamp in Brazil. So Camila and Gabriel, you have about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Guilherme, for the great presentation and for the invitation to participate. So, um, well, um, perhaps it, it, it is better if I share the presentation so that I can change the slides, uh, if it's okay for you. Uh, you can change, you can, uh, you can, uh, Change the slide by yourself, uh, even if it's not you that you are sharing right now. You have arrow on the left and the right side of the slides that will appear if you put ah, your okay. mouse in it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so um, the idea is to uh, to, pre to to present first a, a very simple uh, framework in which the three dimensions of sustainable development can be addressed. Uh, what are these uh, three dimensions, the economic, the social, and the environmental dimension? Uh, to, to have a, a, an integrated analytical framework in which uh, discuss these, these three di dimensions, we define three rates of growth. Uh, the first rate of growth is the one which is consistent with economic sustainability and uh, it is the uh, rate of growth which is consistent with balance of payments uh, equilibrium. Uh, Guillermo already mentioned uh, that, uh, in, 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 uh, particularly in, peri in peripheral countries, the external constraint is, uh, uh, is the binding constraint on, on economic growth. So there is a maximum that the periphery can grow without uh, uh, facing problems of external crisis. So there is a one economic dimension, there is a social dimension. That is, there is a minimum rate of growth that the periphery needs to grow so that it can uh, absorb informal workers and low productivity workers, informal employment with increasing productivity. This, this minimum rate of growth is what we call uh, the social equilibrium rate of growth. It's, it's, a, it's a rate of growth that is necessary to sustain uh, increasing equality and better income distribution. And finally, there is a maximum rate of growth that the periphery can attain uh, if uh, the periphery um, <clears throat> should uh, will honor the commitments uh, made in the Paris Agreement and in the National Determined Contribution. Is, is a proxy for what we call environmental sustainability, a maximum rate of growth that uh, protects the environment for the future generations. Uh, <clears throat> the, the rate of growth that is uh, sustainable, sustainable from an economic per uh, perspective is the one defined by Serge Boileau in which uh, the rate of growth of the periphery equals the income elasticity of exports divided by the income elasticity of imports time, times the rate of growth of the center. Uh, when there exists a, a technology gap, when, when the periphery is a technological laggard, this implies that the pattern of specialization of the periphery will be in low-tech sectors. And specialization in low-tech sectors in primary commodities uh, means a, a very low income elasticity of exports and a very high income elasticity of imports. So this elasticity ratio will tend to be very low in the periphery. And if the periphery uh, will grow, it needs to change the pattern of specialization. It needs industrial policy to uh, encourage a structural change and uh, change the elasticities of uh, the income elasticities of exports and imports. Uh, this is just a, a, <clears throat> a graph showing that uh, high tech sectors tend to uh, show a higher income elasticity of exports 
And this graph uh, uh, shows how uh, the specialization in high-tech sectors changed in, in, in different regions and countries. Uh, why, why I think this, this graph is so important? Because it shows that specialization is not fate. Specialization can be changed and can be changed by policies, in particular industrial and technological policies. Uh, what you see in the graph is the evolution of uh, the science-based industries and specialized suppliers industries, which are the high-tech industries in the classification suggested by Keith Babbitt. And you see how China, which is, which is the orange uh, curve, increased through time the participation of these high-tech industries. While in the case of Latin America, which is the green line, uh, such change did not happen. And this is why uh, Latin America tend to show such a low income elasticity of uh, exports. What about the rate of growth, which is the minimum for social uh, equilibrium? As I mentioned, this rate of growth is related with the creation of formal employment, strengthening the formal labor market, and financing universal social protection, the construction of a welfare state in, in, in the periphery. There is a minimum rate of growth which is necessary for that. Uh, this is a, a graph that shows in a very schematic way the relationship between structural change and formal employment and income distribution in a, in, in a peripheral country. Uh, on the northwest, uh, uh, this, this graph shows uh, the, the curve is the uh, balance of payments constraint rate of growth. You have the growth of the center on the y, on the x axis, and you have the growth of the periphery in the x uh, axis. And you see that uh, the rate of growth of the periphery depends, of course, on the rate of growth of the center for its exports, but the, uh, the slope of the curve is the income elasticity of exports divided by the income elasticity of imports. We need to change this, uh, the pattern of specialization, the elasticity, so that uh, the rate of growth can move from A to B. And by doing this transformation, we uh, can change the level, the share of formal employment in total employment in the periphery, which is what you see in the uh, Northeast uh, graph. Uh, there is an increase in formal employment. Formal employment is N on the X axis of this uh, graph. And why, when formal employment increases, what show, what uh, you can see in the graph, uh, in the in the south is uh, is uh, the increase in the wage share in in the economy something that uh, is not represented in, in the graph is that the increase in the wage share in the in the economy because of the equation of silos lavini can lead to gains in productivity and new transformations in the pattern of specialization but this is not represented just to to, to keep the, the 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 graph simple so <clears throat> structural change is necessary for having better in, uh, income distribution, for reducing uh, informality, with an, a very significant impact on the productivity of the, of the uh, <clears throat> Latin American countries. In the graph, you see the, uh, on the left, the percentage of informal workers in total employment. And on the right, the levels of productivity of the informal workers as compared to formal workers. And you see that almost half, almost half of the workers in Latin America are in the informal sector. And the informal sector has a level of productivity which is about 20% of the, or, or lower than the level of productivity of the um, uh, of the formal sector. So there is a large proportion of the labor 
the workforce in informal activities and the difference in terms of productivity between formal and informal sector are, are extremely high. Finally, uh, we, we need to grow uh, at, a, 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 at a high rate, which should be compa compatible with uh, equilibrium in, in the external sector. But also we need to grow uh, within a path which also implies less emission, the coupling from growth between growth and emissions. Uh, <clears throat> we, we made some, some estimates for Latin America and we found uh, in the Latin American case what we called a uh, center periphery environmental frontier. For each rate of growth of the center, what is the, what the maximum rate of growth of the periphery? is that is uh, consistent with the national determined contributions. Uh, this is, uh, I will not enter in the uh, technical <clears throat> aspects of the estimation, uh, but uh, we identified uh, 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 the importance of catching up in green technologies if the periphery uh, is to grow and at the same time same time to uh, decouple to prevent uh, emissions to reach levels that are in the long run unsustainable. Uh, <clears throat> the good news uh, in, our, in our study, this is a work by Romero and Camila, uh, the good news is that if we move towards high tech sectors, and this implies a lot of industrial and technological policy. If we move towards these high tech sectors, we can achieve at the same time a pattern of specialization that allows us to grow uh, at a higher rate, rate without facing external crisis, but also moving towards a more complex uh, production structure. It helps the coupling emissions from growth so there is a, the possibility that there is a complement between uh, these technological policies in the sense that contribute to both objectives, namely structural change to foster income distribution and competitiveness, but also the coupling from uh, the coupling emissions from economic growth. Sustainable development implies the equality between the three rate of growth, the social equilibrium, the economic equilibrium, and the environmental equilibrium. Uh, I, I <coughs> uh, give some, some examples of, uh, of, the, uh, of the gaps that exist between these three rate of, of growth. I don't have time to, to discuss this, uh, the dynamics of the model, but I would like to finish with uh, this, this message. What we need to, to, to achieve this equality between the social, the economic, and the uh, environmental rates of growth uh, is, from one hand, a technical change, which is technical progress, which is the basis of, of all this transformation, transformation in the economic structure to attain competitiveness and transformation in the economic structure to uh, reduce emissions and at the, while, while at the same time creating uh, decent jobs. So this is one side, the basis, so to say, of, uh, uh, of, of, of the policies for sustainable development, but also crossing all these uh, all these transformations in the production structure, we need a very strong policy of income redistribution, the construction of social uh, policies, of universal social policies that reduce, from one hand, the need to grow at still higher rates to create more employment and, and, and better jobs, uh, and uh, encourage equality, which we believe is also a critical input in any transformation of uh, the production structure within a, a democratic society. So I stop here. Thank you very much once again for the invitation and I hope 
that this uh, brief uh, presentation of the model uh, may contribute to, 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 to the very interesting uh, points raised by Guillermo in his presentation. Thank you, Gabriel. So continuing the presentation, you have now had a chance to review the main conceptual or theoretical framework uh, named the three gap model. And now um, we would like to present to you some scenarios. Some scenarios we have simulated uh, seeking to close the three gaps uh, uh, simultaneously. Uh, these scenarios are published in a paper named uh, Three Gap Model uh, in El Trimestre Economico, which is a Mexican academic journal. And an update has also been uh, published in the sessions document, which is the main position document of ECLAC uh, at the end of last year. So um, the starting point and something I wanted to tell you a bit more is that ECLAC or CEPAL for its Spanish acronym um, has been promoting an approach named the big push for sustainability. This is essentially an approach to help frame the debate on green recovery, on a sustainable recovery, on how to build a new development model in Latin America and the Caribbean that can close the three gaps. The name, uh, the big push, stems from the classic uh, development theory of uh, the, big, the big push from Paul Rosenstein Rodin. Mm -hmm. And it essentially is an approach uh, centered on transformative investments on how um, on on the extent of uh, of investments that need to be mobilized and what kinds of investments that need to be mobilized in order to uh, steer a process of structural change. So uh, the objective of the simulation exercise was to assess the trajectories or the possible paths to close the three gaps, the social, economic, and environmental in Latin American and Caribbean countries uh, by uh, simulating the implementation of a series of policies that I will present to you in more detail later on. We have used a simulation model named E3ME, which is a model owned by Cambridge Econometrics, and I will present scenarios now. So essentially we simulated two main scenarios. One is a business as usual scenario, which is the reference scenario against which we then compare the big push for sustainability or the sustainable development policies. The baseline scenario uh, is essentially business as usual. It reproduces the development trajectory of the past in Latin America and the Caribbean, meaning uh, there is a lot or a significant extent of social inequalities, of income distribution inequalities, balance of payment constraints, uh, specificities in trade specialization, uh, fragilities in economic uh, growth cycles, etc., and so on. And then we have the sustainable development policies scenario that uh, comprise a set of economic and regulatory policies to foster uh, transformative investments. Uh, a bit more, some words more about the model. Uh, E3ME is a hybrid macroeconometric model with no equilibrium in the sense of a Pareto optimal equilibrium. Uh, of environment, energy, and economy, hence E3 uh, global systems. The version that is currently being used is the latest of a succession of models that have been developed since uh, the 1960s. And the theoretical grounding is 
based on what uh, the authors called new economics, um, which is essentially grounded on post-Keynesian economics, meaning that the model is led by demand and constrained by supply elements. Um, the model is a, a macroeconometric model, so the estimations are, um, are provided by uh, a system of stochastic, stochastic equation, and of course, it meets the accounting identities. Uh, and as mentioned, it is a model developed and owned by Cambridge Econometrics. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is represented uh, uh, explicitly in the model. So some countries are explicit regions in the model with different sectors, energy um, sources and users, uh, namely Argentina, Brazil, Colombia and Mexico. And then there is an aggregated region uh, with selected countries in the region named uh, rest of Latin America. So this is the re representation of, of the region in the model. Uh, it comprises uh, 61 world regions. Um, there are 69 economic sectors for European countries and 43 for non-European countries. There are different uh, carriers or sources of energy represented in the model. 14 different uh, atmospheric contaminants, including all greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a model based on the history. Um, it, it only has, it's, it's a simple model in the sense that there are only 29 stochastic uh, equations. But once these uh, equations interact uh, on the level of 61 uh, regions, uh, over 40 economic sectors. This means that are over 40,000 uh, individual equations uh, being solved simultaneously. Um, I, I will not go into too much detail about the model. Uh, I don't think we have time for that today, but very briefly, the model is comprised by three modules. One is the economic module in which the economic activity and the price levels are defined. Then there is an energy module in which the uh, consumed amount, the consumed quantity and the price of uh, energy is defined. And then there is a, an environmental model that essentially defines the amount of uh, contaminants. And these three modules interact with each other. So, uh, for instance, um, the price and the quantity of energy, of course, interacts with the economic module, with the, which in its turn interacts with the energy model. So the feedback loops are there. And this is why this is also named a nonlinear model, because all modules are interacting simultaneously. Uh, a bit perhaps uh, uh, some words about the more about the economics of the model. It is a demand-led model. And so uh, the interactions or the feedback loops depart from demand. Uh, so um, let me check the time. Yeah, I think we have briefly time to cover that. So if we look at the investment loop, for instance, if there is an increase uh, on investments, this will then, of course, represent an increase in demand and uh, demand will then create an expansion of outputs. The income loop, which is uh, represented by the blue uh, arrows, uh, if there is an increase in income, this then represents or results in an increase in household expenditure, which of course uh, leads to an increase in total demand, expanding output. Uh, the increase in output then uh, uh, implies uh, more demand for labor, uh, which results in increased employment, which then uh, again fosters the income loop. And then there is the trade loop, uh, if there is uh, an increase in the demand from a foreign country, this then uh, reverts into expand, uh, expanded imports. Uh, this can result, depending on how the elasticities are defined, uh, on an increase of imports from the, from the country. So these three main loops are 
the main form by which um, these uh, interactions occur in the model and the main breaks or the main uh, elements that restrict. So this is not uh, an infinite loop in the sense that any impulse is finite. Uh, so the breaks are defined by the elasticities themselves, uh, the interactions between the sectors, and of course, the impact on costs and prices. So increasing demand will, of course, result also in increasing prices, and this will is how um, the loops are then restricted. So this is a bit more about the economics of the uh, economic module in E3ME. Uh, as any model, E3ME has shortcomings. Uh, as, it, an, as it is a macroeconometric model, it depends strongly on the quality of the data. So if the data use uh, have limitations or gaps, this of course creates severe uh, issues with the results. Uh, it is based on historical relationships and as we know this looking back at the mirror is not always a good proxy for the future so it's difficult to capture future uh, changes especially in terms of elasticities and of course it is a large-scale complex model and at times it can be complex to also interpret the results um, there are also limitations regarding the treatment of financial markets uh, this is essentially a model based on real uh, sectors dynamics. So uh, the scenarios that we have ran, uh, reminding again, we have ran two main scenarios. The first one being the reference or baseline scenario, uh, which represents business as usual. And then we have the sustainable development policies. In this scenario, we have simulated policies that promote, foster, or accelerate investments in strategic sectors. These sectors uh, are identified by ECLAC as sectors that have potential to deliver benefits in the three dimension, dimensions. So potential positive impacts on the economy, on the social dimension, and on the environment. And the sectors that we have simulated have been uh, renewable energy, electromobility, bioeconomy, the digital transition, the manufacturing industry of health, circular economy, and the care economy. Uh, here you have some more details about each of the policies that have been applied to each of these sectors. I will not go into too much detail. You can um, assess the details in the paper and in the sessions document that we can make available to you. Uh, but going into the results of uh, the simulations for uh, policies that can drive or can push investments in these uh, strategic sectors. Um, so here you can see in the graph, I'm sorry, it's available only in Spanish, uh, investments that lead to a transition in the energy matrix. Here you can see that we simulated an increase, uh, a fourfold increase in the, um, in the capacity of renewable energy uh, in the region. Here you can see the simulations uh, in terms of electromobility. So essentially we simulated policies that lead to an, an increase in the share of electric vehicles uh, in the fleet. Uh, in terms of the bioeconomy, we simulated an increase uh, in the consumption of biofuels in the transport sector and also uh, investments in the recovery of degraded land, essentially uh, investments in reforestation. Uh, in terms of the digital economy, we have simulated uh, uh, increase in investments related to IT infrastructure um, and communication uh, sectors. And in terms of the circular economy and the care economy, we have simulated an increase in public spending in these sectors. Uh, the results, so for now you can see our intentional uh, changes to the model. So this is the intended change we wanted to cause in these sectors, in these strategic sectors 
sectors. And now I'm going to uh, present briefly the main economic, social, and environmental impacts. In terms of the um, economic dimension, you can see in the top left graph that there is a positive impact on GDP for all of the countries. The positive impact on GDP is led, or uh, the, the strongest element of GDP that increases are investments. And this is, of course, by design. We have simulated policies that foster, that accelerate investment. So we are talking about uh, an investment-led growth cycle, but an investment-led growth cycle led by green, sustainable, transformative investments. This also results in an increase in consumption due to the feedback loops of the model. And in terms of the trade balance, which, which is the bottom uh, right graph, uh, there is a mixed uh, impact, which has to do with what uh, Guilherme and Gabriel were presenting earlier. Uh, the productive structure of the countries matter. So for some of the countries, there will be a negative impact uh, on the trade balance. Uh, and for others, there will be a positive one. And this has to do on how they are inserted in the global value chains. Um, here you can see some uh, of further economic results, exports, imports. Uh, I wanted to highlight the uh, impact on employment, which is the bottom left graph. So the increase in GDP helps close the social gap in the sense that more employment are created. And most importantly, we can see in the bottom right uh, graph the impact on wages. So the fact that the increase in wages is greater than the increase in employment means that the new employment uh, is better paid. Uh, it, the, it, there is a, a, an accelerated uh, creation of, of wage or value in the economy. Uh, the impact in terms of the Gini is very small. You can see that it is inferior to 0.5%, but it's still uh, worrisome because if there are no income distribution policies, the green transition can create um, uh, some uh, worsening of income distribution in the region. And in the, in the right-hand side, you can see the impact in terms of CO2 equivalent emissions. And in all the, the countries, there is a significant reduction uh, over 50%, for instance, in the case of Mexico. So these uh, scenarios, in short, they represent um, or they show a simulation or they illustrate a case whereby a set of uh, selected policies can drive GDP growth while creating jobs, creating high uh, pay jobs, uh, and at the same time, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The attention points uh, that link directly to the earlier presentations is that we have indeed to observe the productive structure. And the more uh, these jobs can be internalized, in the economy or the more these technologies can be produced within national borders, uh, the higher the social and the economic uh, impacts will be. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop here. I think I have exceeded a little bit of the time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Camila and uh, Gabriel, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, to, rem to remind the participant that join uh, later uh, the, the webinar, you can ask a question on the question part, and I will uh, communicate the question at the end of all the presentations. So we, we still have one last presentation uh, from Igor uh, Paunovic. Um, Igor is the Chief of uh, Economics and Environment Affairs at uh, UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on trade and development in, Gen in Geneva. He holds degrees in economics from the University of Zagreb in Croatia and the New School uh, for Social Research in New York. Uh, so previously he was chief of the economic development unit of the, of the CEPAL in Mexico City. So uh, you have about 15 minutes. We will try to save about 15, 20 minutes for, um, 
the discussion at the end. The floor is yours, Igor. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it is a pleasure and I would like to uh, thank Agence uh, Francaise de Développement uh, for the invitation to participate. We've heard quite a lot of the analysis uh, already. My analysis will be uh, slightly different and will provide um, uh, an, an emphasis on structural transformation and green transition from a developing country perspective. Um, so I hope to be able to um, give um, a complementary aspects to what we have heard already. Um, I will start with the importance of structural transformation and present some long-term trends and then discuss a little bit what does it mean to have structural transformation in a climate constrained world. Then we'll discuss a green transition and structural transformation and then we'll end with challenges and proposals. So very briefly and, and very fast, uh, what is structural transformation? We are basically in that process shifting resources and the policy focus from traditional sectors, activities, low productivity activities in sectors and te low technology to new sectors, new activities, higher productivity, higher technology. And it can take place within sectors and across sectors. Why it matters? Well, it is essential for development. It's a source of productivity growth, decent and skilled jobs, learning and knowledge accumulation, and source of higher income and aggregate demand. So this is what we basically want uh, from the economic development. Trade plays a key role uh, in an open economy and in the globalized world. The starting point obviously is that what you produce and what you export matter and the balance of payments constraints uh, is one way of thinking of that because some goods are associated with higher value and productivity. It's obviously one thing if you produce and export uh, raw material and completely different thing if you are producing electric cars and exporting to the rest of the world. So no country basically has succeeded uh, in the development process without uh, fast and strong structural transformation. What drives structural transformation? Basically, we know that it's manufacturing because it has very specific characteristics more value added, more productivity driven activities than, than in other sectors of the economy. So it's an opportunity to raise productivity for technological upgrading, for innovation, for creating virtual links uh, between demand and supply side of the economy and for that productive in employment. Uh, this is not to say that agriculture and services are not important, but productivity is much higher in manufacturing so we want resources to shift from agriculture to manufacturing uh, as part of the process of development investment in particular public investment is very important for structural transformation industrial policy we already heard strategic integration into the global economy regional and global production networks also as we know from the East Asian development uh, experience, developmental state is very important for um, achieving uh, structural transformation. Now, some data going back 50, 60 or, or even uh, 70 years in the case of Latin America, you can see in the, in the first column here, employment uh, share uh, by sector and you you see the green part the agricultural employment in latin america decreased rapidly until the 1980s and not so rapidly afterwards uh, the important point i think is in africa africa is still very much agriculturally dominated uh, continent and what you can see is also if you compare um, the first and the second column, the green part is employment 
uh, in agriculture. And here, the green part in the second column is the value added of agriculture. And you can see that there's a lot of people in the agriculture in everywhere, but they produce in terms of value added much smaller part. It's the reverse part with the employment in uh, manufacturing and the value added is manu in manufacturing is the, uh, the biggest. And in the case of Asia, you see how rapidly manufacturing has increased its value added, uh, although Asia still has quite a um, big agricultural sector. But its uh, policies are um, geared towards um, um, strengthening manufacturing, and uh, this shows on these graphs. In terms of productivity in manufacturing compared to the USA, we see uh, really, um, you know, long-term trends where Latin America was uh, at the 40% of the US until the um, last decade of the 80s, and now is less than 20%. Africa was around 20% and now is below 10%. So basically, you can see that the um, neoliberal period from the 1980s clearly marks the the break in the tendencies of any catching up uh, in terms of productivity compared to the US. The only region um, that really uh, did catch up to some extent is Asia from less than 15% in 1960s to more than 30% uh, now. And the last uh, piece of evidence is that catching up is really hard to do. What we here see on the left-hand side is the first year uh, newly industrialized economies um, that really uh, had very steep and, and, and fast development. China also in the last three decades, Southeast Asia and South Asia catching up, but very slowly. On the right-hand side, we have Latin America and the Caribbean, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, basically stagnant. So this is what we have as historical trends. Now to move to uh, what we called climate constrained world. We think that industrial policy matters even more today because of the global economy is more diversified and polarized. There are limits to the strategy of export-led growth. It cannot be used as it was uh, the case in the previous decades. There is inadequate employment creation, middle-income trap, growing inequality, monopolistic tendencies, especially in, in uh, IT sectors, but in, in many other sectors as well, and rapid technological advances. But the most important of all is the onset of a large and growing impact of climate change. And now we all have to deal with that impact. So developing countries must adapt their developing strategies to the new challenges of the 21st centuries. And I think we really need to think hard what is going to be a successful development strategy for the 21st century. East Asian development strategies are less available today because of these many reasons, less policy space, economies are more dependent on international capital flows, less uh, trade and investment rules are not conducive to creation of domestic productive capacity, etc. But most important, the fossil fuel based model of East Asia, if replicated by developing countries, would take emissions and resources consumption way beyond the planet's ecological capacity. And that's not possible. We know that it's going to uh, make the, the uh, civilization disappear if we go to four or more um, um, degrees above the pre-industrial level. Plus, we have additional issue which is or, ch or challenge, which is transitioning to a new techno-economic paradigm whose energy base is still not entirely decided. So we are shooting at a moving target. 
So what kind of development strategy can be successful under these adverse conditions? That's a big task ahead of all of us. We've already seen the definition of the green transition by Guillermo Magacho and, and others. But we have to ask ourselves if the path to a structural transformation was full of ob obstacles so far, why do we expect developing countries to embark on a rapid green transition if they don't receive sufficient international support? And I think this is really the crucial issue uh, for the green transition. Because green transition is just one of many challenges of, of developing countries. It's not a main policy priority. There are other challenges like rapid industrialization, providing employment to youth population, managing rapid and chaotic urbanization, especially in, in uh, Africa, but, but in many Asian countries as well, adapting to impacts of climate change, etc. So in uh, our trade and development reports, we analyzed some of these issues um, in relation to climate adaptation. But basic conclusion is we have to promote structural transformation, industrialization and economic uh, diversification with the goal to build a low carbon industrial system. This, is, this has become inevitable even in developing countries. So this idea that uh, green transition is something and these are the problems of the advanced economies no longer applies. There are also benefits to, to that transition, especially energy transition and emerging circular economy, which can uh, have quite substantial benefits potentially for developing countries. It, it, for example, decoupling of economic activity from natural resource use, uh, re reduction of quantity of new resources, potentially can be operated many of these technologies at very low scale. So even small island developing uh, countries can, can um, have uh, uh, efficient production uh, with these technologies. is more equally distributed worldwide than fossil fuels. But I think it remains that without sufficient international support, this will be impossible. And for the case of the least developed countries, it is even more so. Just to give you one data, there are 14% of the global population, but only around 1% of carbon emissions. In per capita terms, they emit only 10% of the world average. But they are the, so they are the least responsible for climate change, but most vulnerable to it. But again, Whatever they do on their own, they need uh, large international support. So some of the challenges uh, facing developing countries. First, lack of financial resources. They don't have the kinds of uh, financial resources needed for green transition. Technological barriers, we know that. Governance and institutional capacity, inadequate infrastructure, both new for, for green, but also in, in terms of, of older infrastructure, and also limited policy space to pursue their own strategy of economic development. Obviously, these are all internal domestic uh, challenges. But more importantly, there are global uh, systemic challenges. And one is particularly important, lack of sufficient financial support. Um, international community uh, is not providing the kinds of financing that is needed for a green transition to developing countries. There are also trade barriers, non-tariff or CBAM, uh, which we can discuss later. There are intellectual property rights, uh, because most of uh, patents and intellectual property rights are in developed countries. So it's expensive for developing countries to actually acquire them. Unequal participation in global governance, limited access to information. And lastly, but probably the most important, global rules are biased against developed countries, developing countries, sorry. Because measures prohibit, 
pro prohibited under WTO are less important at advanced levels of development, but they do reduce policy space to promote productive capacity at earlier stages of development. And now some proposals which we think in UNCTAD that could help um, unclog uh, this. First of all, green developmental state. So it means a developmental state uh, more or less on the East Asian development experience uh, based on, on, on their experience, but with the, this green push. Larger policy space, reform of the global rules, not just trade, but in, in other parts, and specific emphasis on reforms to TRIPS and TRIMS and subsidies. This, these three uh, elements are, are crucial uh, for developing countries. Adequate financing options for developing countries, there's a big debate on that. Meaningful technology transfer from developed to developing countries and really basing all this uh, on special and differential treatment at the WTO and common but differentiated responsibilities in the uh, UNFCCC. Uh, to really have a development and climate agenda that responds to the needs of development of, of developing countries. I would stop here and thank you for your attention. If there are um, any issues to discuss, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Igor, for this uh, nice, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, so uh, I will now uh, open the discussion. We we don't have so much time, but there was three presentations, so it's quite normal. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, I will try to to summarize some qu key questions that I I, I I have seen in the in the question part of the app. Uh, maybe the the first question uh, that uh, I could ask to the speakers. It, it was raised during the Guilherme presentation, but it stands for uh, everyone, everyone, I guess. Uh, is uh, green transition limited to climate uh, challenges? What about biodiversity, land, land sorry, and soil degradation and water? Uh, are they taking into account? And this, uh, there is another question quite related. Is there is uh, any model that links uh, energy climate, cli climate challenge, sorry, with biodiversity and uh, ecosystem services, mm. uh, mm. as the research uh, shows that they are not uh, independent one from the other. So, uh, could you, uh, everyone, want to, to answer that uh, that two question? Uh, please uh, let me use your mic. I can start because <laughs> it's like uh, probably the other are more tired than me because it was the person. Well, I think I completely agree that biodiversity and land, water is like something crucial if you're thinking about like developing countries, because sometimes like, uh, uh, and, but there are some difference when you're uh, thinking about like climate impacts or like climate related issues with, uh, with relation to the, let's say other environmental aspects that we can include in the discussion. First, like when you're talking about like CO2 emissions, we're talking like something that uh, we can measure more easily and the impacts are more global than local. Uh, but anyways, like if we're thinking of countries that are, um, and this is happening with many developing countries, they suffer from a lot of land stress, water stress, like land pressures from uh, deforestation, water, and uh, to sustain the economic growth that they have today, they depend on water. They depend on land use. They depend on all uh, the biodiversity loss. And this is definitely not the right way of <laughs> uh, thinking about like uh, a green transition. When you're thinking about green transition, we need to consider. We need to account for this uh, these issues as well. Like uh, uh, we cannot like have countries that depend on biodiversity loss within the country to produce the goods, produce the, uh, the, the investment needed to, to do the transition. 
we need to create alternatives. And then I think uh, Igor's presentation was very clear on this, like uh, either you have like this structural transformation on the uh, on developing cultures, uh, which can, for example, came from like natural related, uh, natural uh, natural based uh, technologies, like they cannot keep using the same technologies as the, the North is using. Uh, they cannot because like, the, the needs are different and maybe uh, these more nature-based technologies, nature-based solutions are mo much more efficient in, in these ecological aspects as a whole, not only thinking about uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, I don't know, like photovoltaic energy is a great solution for solving one specific issue, which is like uh, high emissions in the energy sector. But if you're talking about like developing country, you're talking about like you can you need to create solutions for like the hydro stress that you can have. Uh, we can need we need to create solutions for the land use, which is for sure something that uh, the, uh, most of the countries that uh, if you think about Latin American countries, they have a lot of pressure on these. Like they are deforesting. Uh, most of these emissions are not coming exactly uh, from energy. They are coming from uh, raising of cattle or, uh, or uh, from agriculture itself. So uh, I completely agree that the models need to do this. If they exist, <laughs> this is another story. Like, unfortunately, they, they are now being, they start, let's say, uh, we are start thinking about this. Because climate is here in the table, like for years, decades maybe, uh, but the other biodiversity aspects are uh, bio, the other ecological aspects are like quite new in this sense. Okay, Rio, the conference in Rio was in '92. It's 30 years from now, but it's still, uh, and this is one of, one of the main aspects there. But it's still like it's nothing compared to climate. And it's nothing compared to CO2, and the, there is the need to develop first uh, me good measures for this which is something that we don't have. If you want to talk about this, we need to find a way to measure the impacts, measure the implication. And uh, second, include this in the, the models because like, definitely this is something that is missing. Yeah. Uh, may I make a, a brief, very brief comment uh, regarding the questions? Um, no, first, uh, I think that Pierre um, uh, made in the chat uh, a comment about uh, that most of these, of these problems are really global problems, but the solutions are to a large extent uh, local. And we need a lot of, of, of research on uh, national and local conditions, both social and uh, ecological and economic. What I'm trying to say is that at the building of uh, endogenous technological capabilities in Latin America or in the developing economies in general are really critical for working out this, this global challenge. It's, it's something that I think Igor also mentioned. I mean, uh, building capabilities in, in the periphery is, is key if, if any kind of sustainable development path path is to be attained so uh this is this is one 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 comment that I, I i would like to make and and this of course has a lot to do with uh, biodiversity the contamination of waters and salt and everything uh, we need to develop this these capabilities at home uh the other is is uh, also uh, regarding this a point that igor also raised which is uh, the need for a different kind of governance in which the policy space for, for developing economies should be really broadened, expanded. Uh, many uh, economists are talking about uh, democracy enhancing governance. The need to make the international governance uh, consistent with the objectives of development and the objects of or the objective of uh, democracy. Uh, the, the type of international system that we have clearly is not functional to, 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 to promote uh, sustainable development. And it 
it is becoming increasingly less functional because we see the arms race, we see the geopolitical tensions, uh, rivalries, all, all these uh, uh, trends are, are really complicating the possibility of building a new kind of multilateral international system in which development is, is at the core of the, of the system. So that, that is what I, I would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Camilla, you want to add something uh, maybe very, very briefly uh, to in order to, to tackle other uh, issues and yeah. questions? Yes, of course. Sorry, I, I won't resist. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that this question uh, really brings a point that is critical, which is the need for pluralism in um, economic science and in uh, ecological and low carbon transition in general. So there is no single model that will be able to account for all relevant dimensions and aspects. There are land use models. Uh, there are specific uh, models that have the space dimension represented and this then translates into deforestation and then you can see the areas that will be deforested and the value of the ecosystem services uh, in those areas. So there are these kinds of modeling and I just wanted to briefly highlight this point uh, the importance of having a plurality of models and also of creating soft links between the models. So one type of model can create uh, or generate outputs that then become inputs into other models and then there can be a, a soft link between them. These kinds of exercises have happened in the past and the results are quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, report now to question maybe maybe from uh, Igor or anyone else who wants to jump in. Uh, do you think that micro uh, finance schemes could meet part of the demand of financial investment needed in developing countries? And uh, what uh, incentives exist for developed country to transfer technology to a uh, developed country? To developing countries, mistake. Sorry. Of course. Okay. Uh, let me try to, to give a brief uh, answer to that. I think microfinance is important for SMEs, for small, medium sized enterprises or micro enterprises, but actually the uh, productivity growth and technological innovation is happening in at least middle sized uh, and mostly in big companies because you have to have resources so, for, for innovation. So microfinance can be used to acquire or already existing technology for example, solar, solar panels or, or something like that. But you really cannot expect that microfinance can play a big role in the technological uh, progress in developing countries. Regarding technology uh, transfer from developed to developing countries, that's an area probably with finance, the most critical area and probably the most underappreciated area uh, in today's uh, discussions. We don't have any incentives worldwide, globally, to transfer uh, technology from advanced economies to, to developing countries. And this lack of framework and incentives basically means that developing countries have to deal with that issue on their own. So if it's a case of ex uh, colony, for example, and you have good relationship with, with the, the center, then you might be able to get some uh, technologies in concessionary terms, but this is not enough, not nearly enough. So the majority of, of developing countries actually uh, would have to acquire the uh, technology, new technologies for green transition. And this 
comes to the going back to the balance of payments constraint to their productive structure to their export and import elasticities and of course we know that if they uh, uh, acquire this technology on the world market their debt situation will um, uh, deteriorate uh, substantially and right now developing countries many of them uh, more than 60 developing countries are in uh, debt distress or very close to debt distress according to the IMF data that means they really have to decide do we pay our foreign debt or we finance education uh, health uh, social services or do we invest in green technologies so right now the biggest problem that i see is that developing countries are in an impossible uh, situation where they really have to decide what are their priorities and a lot of um, um, discussion is how do we deal with that what are the policy options and that's the reason why i i put as as one of the main obstacles for green transition the help of the international or or the lack of help of the international community so uh, i think these would be the most important things to to discuss thank you thank you uh, igor uh, if anyone want to add something or i move to the next uh, the next question it's okay so uh, i had a question that i cannot find anymore but i will try to rephrase it um someone asked about uh, social uh, social dialogue uh in in, in, the, in the question part uh, because we always talk about policy dialogue in order to convince that it's important to put some mitigation measure and structural changes and so on but uh, what about uh, the space that is given to social dialogue to uh, civils to make them understand that it's not uh, it's necessary to to move toward green transition and it would not happen uh, uh, by um, limiting their development uh, if there is any space for that and discussion around that for this social acceptance if if no one uh, says uh, I, I i i think guillermo speak please speak first go ahead go ahead <laughs> no very briefly i think that the the crucial issue uh, in the implementation of a green transition policy and a just transition policy is a political economy question i think uh, everybody uh, implicitly or explicitly uh, mentioned this 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 political economy challenge as crucial uh, to to implement the, the big push the the green big push uh, the sustainability green push that Camila uh, argued for. You need to redirect private and public investment towards social and ecological uh, uh, goals and this is critically a problem of solving uh, the uh, the conflict between power and interests that we have in, in, in the economy in this sense the social dialogue uh, must be a crucial input a necessary step if we ever want to to have a, a, a policy for sustainable development not only at the national level but also at the international level just, just that thank you yeah it's very related to this that i want to put it's like uh, uh we cannot like we're talking about uh, solutions in the local level solutions in the international level 
Uh, when you're talking about solutions local level, it's basically, I'm not saying the international, international for sure is like, uh, but in the local level, it's basically like uh, the, the social, uh, you need to have like dialogue. Uh, we cannot think about like, uh, I don't know, I, I'm from Brazil, so it's like, <laughs> I'll talk about Amazonia. Uh, it's impossible to have like an ecological transition, uh, uh, nature based activities there if you're not understanding the social needs, if you're not understanding the social, uh, the social scheme, actually, because like uh, we have people there that are like, uh, you have the pressure from the, agri uh, the agriculture pressure, mining pressure, but also the indigenous people. Like, so like you need to create like, uh, and this is why I completely agree with Gabriel, <laughs> if it is, if I correctly understood his point, uh, that uh, we need to have like uh, this, coherent view that is a political economic issue because it's not that we'll be like uh, we're going to find a solution that is going to be like perfect for everybody no there will be like some decisions there will be some interest that will be uh, this behind and what i like a lot on the green big push is that okay we are not finding like uh, so which is the simple base uh, ideas on like how to do this transition uh, uh, is that okay we're not finding a unique solution but if you have like uh, if you change the paradigm if you move to, to another idea and if everything if it's coordinated then that will be much easier because then we have like a lot of interests different social interests that will be connected uh, and then it's possible to do without like uh, if you let the market works by itself of course it's, this is uh, if you just put a carbon price uh, market like a CBAN, for example, that Igor was talking. Uh, this carbon border just to make sense in Europe. The, uh, there will be no automatic uh, transition. There will be no pr probably what happens. Like, uh, we are just like creating more and more insufficiencies, more and more constraints in in developing countries, especially the least developing countries. So there, the, the social aspect of this need to to consider that we need to consider this and need to consider that is a political economy issue if i may just add yes uh, uh, two, two sentences to, to no, this okay, no. i think igor uh, igor you can uh, give your uh, your insights and then i will i will close uh, okay. the, the okay. conversations <clears throat> i totally agree that that uh, social dialogue is necessary and we have to really deal with with something which is which is unprecedented, um, and that's the power, concentrated power in the elites and and uh, sectors which have interest not to change the status quo, because just one uh, data: the world's top one percent of emitters produce over 1,000 times more CO2 than the bottom 1%. So it means we basically need a new model where the interests, the lifestyle of this 1% of top emitters changes dramatically. And of course, they will do everything and they are doing everything possible not to allow that. So if we have a very broad social discussion and understanding of these issues, then this just transition, which would reduce these inequalities in emitting, but also economic inequalities, which are also out of, out of hand. We need to have a very broad social consensus about the direction of the change. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we are uh, uh, running late, so I, I will now, uh, unfortunately, have to close uh, this research conversation. Uh, I'm sorry for the, the question that I couldn't ask directly to the speakers, but I, I, have, I have seen that some, some answer had, had been given directly into the chat by the, the speaker themselves. So uh, I would like to only uh, thank you all, all, uh, all of you. And I hope that all the participants uh, enjoyed uh, this nice uh, webinar and uh, that provides, my, I guess, uh, valuable insights uh, 
in this critical issue. So have a nice uh, evening, afternoon, or end of morning, everyone, and bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. It's great. See you.